Well, good evening, church family. Why don't you uh, stand to your feet as we begin to sing. Uh, we're going to sing uh, several songs throughout the night, and I invite you just to use this time to reflect on the cross, and you can pray, and we will take the Lord's Supper, and this is going to be a wonderful evening as we um, sing about and hear about the work that Jesus did on the cross. So let's sing this together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Sing it out. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. I'm sick. Good evening, church. You know, there's an old African-American spiritual entitled, Were You There? And it asks these questions. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? 
were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Now, church family, I know that we weren't there. But is it possible that for tonight we could picture ourselves there? There's a famous painting by Rembrandt. It's entitled The Raising of the Cross, completed in 1633. And if you were to look closely at this painting, you were to study it, you would see that Rembrandt painted himself into the crucifixion scene, helping to set that cross upright. And here's why. It was Rembrandt's way of saying that it was his sin, along with theirs, that nailed Jesus to the cross that day. And so like Rembrandt, I want us to take time to paint ourselves into the picture like we were there. To become witnesses of all that Jesus would endure on his journey to the cross that Friday. And if we were there, we would watch with our very eyes as Jesus was denied. As Jesus was delivered to be crucified. As Jesus was mocked. As Jesus bore his own cross. As Jesus was nailed to that cross as Jesus suffered, and as Jesus died. This is the journey that we will go on together tonight. It's a journey to the cross. Our first stop on this journey takes us back to the early hours of that Friday morning. After Jesus explains the significance of the Lord's Supper, they sing a hymn, and they walk out to the Mount of Olives. And it was there that he told his disciples that by the end of the night, each one of them would fall away from him, and that Peter would deny Jesus three times before the rooster crows. These words of Jesus did not sit well with Peter. With an overestimation of his love for Jesus, he responds by saying this in Matthew 26. He said, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Jesus spoke. But even though Peter heard what Jesus was saying, he did not believe what Jesus was saying as he passionately declares, I will not deny you. It's interesting that Peter chose not to believe these words of Jesus considering all the things he had seen Jesus' words do. He knew that one word from Jesus could heal diseases and raise dead bodies back to life. He knew that there was power in the words of Jesus. He knew that there was truth in the words of Jesus, but surely not these words. These words could not be true. If only Peter had been right. But in the early hours, they unfolded just as Jesus said that they would. Jesus is betrayed by the kiss of his friend Judas. He's arrested, and he's taken to the house of the high priest. And the Bible says that Peter follows but at a distance. And then, while seated around a fire in the midst of the courtyard, the interrogation began in Luke 22. A servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. Denial after denial, after denial. And then the rooster crowed. As as soon as he heard that sound, the Bible says he made eye contact with his Lord Jesus. Can you imagine that look? When he saw the face of Jesus, it reminded him of his Savior's words, that he would deny him. Words that yet again turned out to be true. Church, you know, it's easy for us to look at Peter and say, how on earth could he deny Jesus? He witnessed his power. He saw all of the miracles. But if we're honest with ourselves, like Peter, we too have denied knowing and following Jesus. And we do so every time we choose sin over Christ. Every time we choose the self over our Savior. For example, students, it might not have been around a fire, but it might have been last night with friends as you chose to pursue sinful activity with the crowd, because choosing Jesus would have been harder. 
Friends, it might not have been by way of interrogation, but it might have been by way of lustful temptation as you sinfully satisfy the desires of the flesh. Church family, it might not have been as public, but it might have been as simple as privately and daily trusting in your own works instead of the finished work of Jesus. As Peter made eye contact with his Lord, he was reminded of and broken over his sin. And it says that he wept bitterly. But in the midst of sin and shame, can I tell you that there is hope for Peter and hope for you and I. You see, Christ's future work on the cross would pay the penalty for Peter's pride, for his fear, for his shame, and for his condemnation. While Peter had been ashamed of the truth, Jesus would bear shame in the name of truth. While Peter was unfaithful, Jesus was uncompromisingly faithful. And as we have sought to follow Jesus, it's possible that we too have overestimated our devotion to God. It's possible that we too have trusted in ourselves instead of his word. It's possible that we too have denied the one that we love. But church, can I tell you, how sufficient is the grace that covers all our sin? A brutal death would lead to a glorious resurrection. The anchor by which we now all declare without shame forevermore that we know we love and we follow the living God, Jesus Christ. It's 6.30 that Friday morning. Many of us might have still been in bed at that point. Pontius Pilate, instead of being in Caesarea, he has traveled to Jerusalem in order to watch over all of the festivities going around, going on in the city during the Passover time. Luke, I'm sorry, Mark tells us that after the religious leaders had consulted, that they bound Jesus in order to turn him over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. They bound him as if to add on more humiliation to the spitting that they had done on him, to punching him, to ripping out his beard. Now they bind the hands of the man who is like a lamb, not even resisted them. They take Jesus to Pilate, but they themselves, they don't enter into Pilate's house because they want to, ironically, remain clean, remain undefiled, so that they can enjoy this Passover feast. As if somehow God would be okay if they are putting an innocent man up to die, but as long as they don't go into a Gentile's house, then that would be okay. I can't throw too many stones. I, too, have minimized my sin, and I, too, have justified my sin just as they have. Pilate decides he will go out to the religious leaders where they demand, of course, they're going to be demanding to put Jesus to death. And they're going to be demanding, let Barabbas free. Pilate returns inside to talk to Jesus. Jesus at this point looks quite disheveled. He's bound, he's bleeding, he's bruised, and now he's being interrogated by Pontius Pilate. If I'm Jesus, I'm probably thinking about past this trial, I am thinking about the pain that lies just around the corner. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Today we know that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They saw all of this face to face. They had seen it happen. They saw the miraculous things. Jesus giving sight to the blind. The dead were coming back to life. All these things, and yet... They refused to believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus stood before the governor that day. And one day that governor would stand before Jesus. Just as every person in this room will one day stand before him. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. We will either hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or we will hear, Depart from me. I never knew you. But every one of us will one day stand before him. In the end, Pilate went out. He sat on some type of elevated platform with a large chair on it. This is where he would declare the condemnation of the Messiah. But before he did that, he would receive a message. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. We don't have much details 
regarding what that dream was about and how it came to be. But just like Pilate, I think of this as the warning to him that he didn't heed. And I think of my own life and how many times God has tried to tell me, Patrick, pay attention. Patrick, take heed of the warnings I'm giving you. Stay away from that, re- that temptation. And you didn't resist. Matter of fact, you got closer to it. And sometimes I have suffered the consequences of those sinful choices. But thanks be to God for his grace. Eventually, Pilate, from his seat of judgment, asked the question that's been known before the foundations of the world. Says, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and our children. Many of us have believed we are innocent of his blood, that we did nothing to send him to that cross. We and our children, surely we're good people. We're innocent of that sin. Peter said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Unless you own your sin, you can't own his salvation. We can learn a lot from Pilate's incorrect assessment when he said, I am innocent. Just because someone arbitrarily declares that they are innocent before God does not mean in any way that they are. He bore our sins that Friday. Pilate can never escape his role in Jesus' death, and we must never forget ours. Some 700 years before these events, God's prophet Isaiah foretold that Jesus would be mocked. He said in Isaiah 53 that Jesus would be despised and rejected by man, that he'd be a man of sorrows and someone who's very familiar with grief and that he would be despised. And then just a few days before Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus himself prophesied as they were entering into Jerusalem that he would be mocked. He told some of his disciples, he said, see, we're going into Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They'll condemn him to death. They'll deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And scriptures tell us that just after Jesus was taken away from Pilate, that In verse 27 of chapter 27 in Matthew, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion. You could picture this is about 600 people. This is an enormous crowd all around Jesus. They said, everyone come and watch. Come and see the fool who says that he's a king. Come and let's have some fun with him. Let's make a spectacle of this Jesus. You can almost hear them taunting Jesus, saying, oh, our apologies, king, but we forgot your crown. We have misplaced your scepter. And so they take a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they give him a scepter. Verse 29, it says they put that crown on his head, and then they put a reed in his hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked, saying, Hail, the king of the Jews, dripping with sarcasm. Now the joke over, they spit on him, they took the reed and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and they put his own clothes on him and then they led him away to crucify him. And then over his head, it says in verse 37, they put a charge against him, like a sign or a a plaque, and it read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. To Jesus, they were mocking him, saying, you wanted to be king, now you're a king. And to all of his followers, they were saying, this is what we'll do to your leader, this is what we'll do to you. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself 
If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So the chief priests with the scribes and the elders, they mocked him too, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, after all, Jesus said, I am the son of God. And then in verse 44, it says, the the robbers who were crucified with him, they also reviled him in the same way. In that part, I don't know about you, but that part was where it was almost too much for me. Because we look at all the people who are mocking Jesus and taunting Jesus and reviling him and spitting on him. But these two criminals who were actually convicted of a crime, these two sinners who actually deserved to be there. See, the whole world knew that this was just a politically corrupt stunt. The whole world knew that Jesus didn't deserve to die. They knew he'd committed no crime. But we can't overlook how absurd it is that Jesus, the perfect and holy son of God, first of all, was placed between two criminals, was lumped together with two convicted criminals, and then they of all people had the nerve to insult him. Notice all of the other groups that mocked and scorned Jesus. We could probably find ourselves among the crowd there one day, on that day. It says that the Roman authorities mocked him for saying that he was the king of the Jews, The crowd in general was saying, you said you would rebuild the temple. Save yourself. Then all of the the religious leaders, they said, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Come down off of the cross. As I was reflecting on this, the, the thought I had was, it's so sad because they were so close to the truth. Even in their mocking. Because he was the king of the Jews, just not the king that they'd expected. And the temple would be restored, destroyed, and rebuilt in three days. Only not Herod's temple. No, Jesus himself, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. His body would be raised in three days. He had a kingdom, only it wasn't the earthly kingdom that they'd expected. No, it was a forever and eternal heavenly kingdom. And he was perfectly capable, make no mistake, Jesus was perfectly capable of saving himself, only he wasn't there to save himself. He was there to save them. Only they couldn't see that he was there to bring about salvation through suffering. How often do we mock or at least doubt God because his deliverance doesn't look like we expected that it would? As one writer put it, all the people gathered there for Jesus' crucifixion were confused. He said, what looked to the unenlightened like a humiliating disaster was really the powerful work of God fulfilling his promise of redemption. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we continue to worship you, I pray that you would help us to have eyes and ears and help our hearts to be attuned to the way that you are rescuing us every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came who in sinners to reclaim Hallelujah what a sin
John 19, 17 says this. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Having suffered through the late night betrayal and arrest, having been dragged back and forth between Pilate and Herod for what turned out to be a circus of a trial, Having received the brutal flogging at the hands of the Roman soldiers, it was now time for Jesus to begin his final leg of his journey towards his sacrifice. And in this verse, we read that with what little physical strength remained in Jesus' humanity, Jesus picked up and carried his own cross towards the place of his crucifixion. Now, the condemned criminal carrying his own cross was actually a common practice at this time designed to add humiliation to an already horrific practice. It was a final act of torture and shame. But what seemed like a perfectly ordinary event from the perspective of a Roman was anything but ordinary within the plans of our sovereign God. See, from a human perspective, Jesus was like any other condemned criminal, under arrest and subjected to the laws and penalties of the Roman state. But what the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures want us to know is that from God's perspective, everything was going according to his plans. See, Jesus wasn't forced to be crucified. He picked up his cross and he carried it willingly. See, unlike every other Jew that was crucified before him, if Jesus wanted to, he had the ability, at least, to free himself at any time during this process. We see examples of this many times throughout the Gospels. In addition to the occasions when we see Jesus evading the mobs who were uh, trying to throw him off a cliff, for example, we see him asserting his sovereignty over everything that happens to him. For example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night Jesus was betrayed, Peter tried to fight off the Roman soldiers who were arresting Jesus, but Jesus stopped him saying, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? See, he's reminding Peter in this moment that even in his betrayal and arrest, everything was going exactly according to the father's plans. Similarly, when Jesus was standing trial on the morning of his crucifixion, he told Pontius Pilate that Pilate would have no authority at all, especially over Jesus in that moment, unless God the Father had made it so. To Pilate, Jesus said in John 18, 36, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews. But that's just the thing. Jesus was not trying to escape the Jews. He was making this sacrifice willingly, even on their behalf. Jesus himself makes this clear in John 10, 18. He says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. See, by Jesus picking up and carrying his own cross, we are given a reminder that Jesus could have gotten out of this at any time if he wanted to. But what Jesus wanted more than to escape his fate was to do the will of the Father. 
What he wanted more than to be rescued from this cross was to redeem you and I from our sin on that cross. And on this Good Friday evening, we cannot miss this incredible truth that should drive us to worship Jesus more fully. Jesus didn't die as a reluctant victim of the Roman Empire. Instead, he carried his cross to his crucifixion as a willing participant of God's plan to pay the price for your sin and mine and to rescue the world for all who would believe. Because the most significant thing that Jesus carried on that day was not the mode of his crucifixion, the wooden cross. It was the meaning of his crucifixion. It was the payment for sin. See, in carrying that cross, Jesus was not just carrying a piece of wood. He was carrying literally the weight of the sins of the world. He was carrying my sin and yours. And Jesus did this willingly. As the author of Hebrews says, it was for the joy that was set before him, he endured this cross. I am told of a geographical location in the heart of London that is called Charing Cross. The spot is referred to simply as the cross. A lost child was one day picked up by a London policeman, and the child was unable to tell him where he lived. Finally, in response to the repeated question of the police, and amid sobs and tears, the little boy said, if you will just take me to the cross, I think I can find my home, way home from there. In fact, the cross of Christ is the only place where lost sinners can find their way home. In other words, the way of the cross leads home. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this, is, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I don't think anyone could ever imagine the kind of pain that being nailed to a cross would cost. It is likely the nail wasn't driven into the hand, but just under the hand through the wrist. The weight of the body would sometimes tear through the hand, so the nail would be driven between the bones on the wrist instead. Just the thought of a nail being driven into the wrist with a hammer into a piece of wood causes me to shudder and tremble. Well, the second article that was nailed to the cross was a sign or a plaque. The Apostle John tells us that Pilate wrote an inscription and nailed it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because it was the place where Jesus was crucified near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek. But despite the overwhelming evidence that Christ was the long-awaited Messiah, the religious leaders rejected him as their rightful king. John 1.11 says he came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But here's the good news. There is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father. Each one of us has the choice to bow before him now as our Savior, as our Lord, and our friend, or we can bow before him one day as our judge. The third thing that is not so obvious that was nailed to the cross is your sin and my sin debt. Let me repeat Colossians 2.14. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Not only has God canceled the sin debt of those who believe, he destroyed the document on which the debt was recorded. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. In conclusion, Jesus was nailed to the cross, which teaches us profound lessons about the depth of God's love 
and the price he paid for our redemption. This truth invites us to confront our brokenness, acknowledge our need for forgiveness, and embrace the grace offered through Jesus Christ. As we gaze upon Jesus, let us remember the immense sacrifice made on our behalf and respond with gratitude and devotion and a renewed commitment to follow the example of our Savior. May reflecting on Jesus being nailed to the cross inspire us to live lives transformed by the redemptive power of God's love and to give ourselves daily to help each one live in that rescuing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In closing, I remind us of a great hymn of the church that we're going to be singing here. But I just want to remind you of one of the verses that goes along with what I'm saying. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. My topic is Jesus Suffered. If you would like to take your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. It's page 613 in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. I like the way that the Holman Christian Standard Version reads, his appearance was so disfigured, he did not look like a man and his form did not resemble a human being. Isaiah 53, then beginning in verse, five, verse uh, 3, excuse me. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. The medical and theological professions have through the years given in-depth analysis into the sufferings of Jesus that took place from that point in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, uh, Garden of Gethsemane all the way to the cross. So let me just take a few brief moments to summarize this unimaginable emotional, 
physical and spiritual sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, those emotional sufferings. Only Luke the physician records this description as Jesus prays there on the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, this is a rare medical condition we now know as hematidrosis, which is a condition in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture. They cause them to exude blood, occurs under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. In the garden, he wasn't just praying, he was crying. He wasn't just crying, he was weeping. He wasn't just weeping, he was sweating, and he wasn't just sweating sweat. He was sweating blood. Number two, physical sufferings. There were the repeated beatings with the Roman flagrum, which was a whip that would have three to 12 strands of leather with metal balls woven into it, which would cause internal damage. At the end of each strand were pieces of broken pottery and glass and nails, bone or twisted metal, which would grab and rip the flesh. There was the crown with thorns up to three inches in length, which were beat into his skull with a rod, which they had also used to batter his face. As Pastor Zach mentioned, the prophecy of Isaiah was written 700 years before their crucifixion, describing that he would be beaten so savagely he would not even look human. Then there was the cross itself, with near eight-inch spikes being driven through his wrists and his feet. After Jesus' death, a Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear. Blood and water came out, indicating that Jesus had experienced hypovolemic shock, which is an emergency condition in which severe blood or other fluid loss makes the heart unable to pump enough blood to the body. Then there was the spiritual suffering. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Pastor Rod made reference. For our sake, God made him Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. Literally, listen, he became a sin offering is the meaning of that verse there. He became a sin offering for us. Now, I'm going to close and go back to Isaiah 53. Listen, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. Some verses, uh, uh, some translations say restitution offering or trespassing offering. This was a sin offering. 2 Corinthians, a sin offering. Isaiah, a sin offering. Book of Leviticus. If you go back and look in Leviticus chapters 5 and 6, it gives the uh, restitution that is required for a sin offering against one another. Listen. He must make full restitution first and full in in full value plus a fifth. He is to pay it to his owner on the day he acknowledges his guilt. Throughout the book of Leviticus, when you see the payment to be paid, it is full restitution plus a fifth. It is 120%. So you may ask, were the sufferings of Jesus sufficient to pay the penalty of my sins how much did he pay for our sins more than enough I want you to take that cup we're going to prepare to take communion I want you to think about something I'm going to ask you give you a question to consider here in just a moment well one of those great aspects of Jesus spiritual suffering is evidenced in his words on the cross when he said My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just think about it. For eternity past, Jesus had enjoyed perfect unity and communion with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And as the sins of all the world throughout all time were placed upon him, the Father had to turn his back upon him. So here's the question I want to ask you. If God was to turn his back on you, which he won't, if he were to forsake you, which he won't, Would you even know it? Would you know it? Is your relationship with Christ so tight, so sweet, that you, if if you knew you were out of fellowship with him, would you even know it? 
The Bible tells us, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So I want us just to take one moment of silent prayer. Give you the opportunity for the Spirit just to put its spotlight on your heart and just check out your fellowship with him right now. I'm going to ask Pastor David underscores for a few moments there and then we'll take this together. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 30, it's a moment of self-examination. I encourage you to do that. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as you take this bread, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Lord, I've been thinking all night long of the body that was broken for us in this cross service night. And we thank you for that together. We thank you personally. We say personally, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you, Father, for nailing those sins upon the cross. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. As we take this, we were uh, rem being reminded, Lord, of what took place thousands of years ago. In anticipation, Father, of what will uh, took place in a couple of three days, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you did not just die, but that you rose from the tomb. And that's the reason that we're here tonight, Lord. So we give thanks to you for your body that was broken for us. We ask it, we thank you in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. When I
Did it 
Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was delivered to be crucified. Jesus was mocked. Jesus bore his own cross. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus suffered. And finally, Jesus gave up his life and died. And in that moment, with your sin and with my sin on his shoulders, Jesus sacrificed himself to pay the price for our sins so that we who were guilty and we who were deserving of death could go free. And what does this payment, this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, tell us about God? What does the cross communicate to us about who God is and what his heart is toward us as wicked and sinful people? who have rebelled against him and are weak and are powerless to save ourselves from our sin. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows, God demonstrates, God confirms, God proves his love for us. How? In that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God shows, present tense, shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died, past tense, for us. What does the death of Jesus show us? What does the death of Jesus put on full display? The death of Jesus 2,000 years ago shows us that God still loves us today. And God's love for you today, right now in this moment, no matter who you are, or where you've been, or what you've done, is unquestionable because of the sacrifice of Jesus. When you've gone the last eight weeks without spending time in your Bible or praying. How does God feel about you? He loves you. When you hurt someone that you love with a cutting word that you know that you can never take back, how does God feel about you? He loves you. When you fall back into that addiction that you swore that you were done with, The last time would be the last time, but it wasn't. How does God feel about you? He loves you. When your stubborn refusal to give up your sin has affected not only you, but has hurt and wounded those who are closest to you, how does God feel about you? He loves you. When you've been away from church for the last six weeks or six months or 60 years, how does God feel about you? He loves you. When you allow the fear of man to stop you from sharing the gospel with someone who desperately needs it in that moment, how does God feel about you? He loves you. When you have utterly failed as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, or as a son or a daughter, how does God feel about you? He loves you. And how do we know it? Because while we were weak, while we were behaving our worst, while we were his enemies, while we were at our lowest, while we had absolutely nothing to offer God and absolutely no reason for him to love us, God once and for all displayed his love for us on the cross of Calvary. And in that love, He offers the free gift of salvation 
For anyone who would turn from their sin and turn to Christ, placing their faith in him to save them. As we close tonight, the question is not whether or not God loves you. He settled that 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. The question tonight is, will you receive his love? Church family, I uh, want to welcome you to stand with us as we worship through singing one last time. As we cast our mind to Calvary, if we leave here tonight, I pray that would be on your mind and on your heart as you meditate on what you heard tonight and as we go into Sunday, because we know Sunday is coming. I hear the Savior say, God's faith indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me.
from 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all time and in every way. May the Lord be with you all. God bless you. See you on Sunday.